All right, well, good morning and good morning again. And we are, I, 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 I love the Christmas season. I don't think it's Christmas Christmas yet because I don't see any snow on the ground, no snowfall. I just want a little bit of snow. That's all I want. I don't want a lot of snow. I just want a little bit of snow. We don't have anything. So it kind of reminds us of, you know, Florida or something. It's nasty, wet outside and there's no snow <clears throat> like that. But I am excited that it is the holiday season here in 2019. And we're just going to keep going through the book of the Gospel of Mark. Now, last week we went through verse 5 of the Gospel of Mark. Main things that we took away from last week's teaching hinges on three things. So let's go through those three things that we went through last week. The first is that confession of sin is mandatory for forgiveness. It is mandatory for forgiveness. In that verse, verse 5, the people came to be baptized, but with that coming to be baptized, they confess their sin. Confession of sin has been a cornerstone in the starting block of repentance. If there's no confession of sin, that means that there's no repentance. And confession is always a prerequisite for other things to transpire throughout Scripture. Mainly, it's the precursor to forgiveness. As we say in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can like that, by the way. Evangelist D.L. Moody said, Unconfessed sin is unforgiven sin. Mm -hmm. And unforgiven sin is the darkest, foulest thing on this sin-cursed earth. I know a lot of Christians who don't confess sin on a regular basis. They don't confess specific sins. And so it's unforgiven sin. You're still in it. There's no cleansing of that sin from your life. So you're still in it. This is the reason why a lot of Christians don't have any power in their lives. There's no confession of sin. There's no coming to the Lord and falling at his feet for mercy. There's no life of repentance. Most just go about their business. Oh, I, you know, I asked him to forgive me once when I got saved and that's it. And that's and they just go on about their business as if that's the only time that they're supposed to confess sin. And they only do it in a general sense. They don't get specific. But God said we are supposed to confess our sin. We're supposed to confess sin and sin specifically. That means we start naming sins that we have done that comes to our minds. So we have to confess sin. Otherwise, it's unforgiven sin. We need to confess it generally on a daily basis. And then those things that we know that we've done, we need to confess those specifically. And we need to have lives of repentance. Lives of repentance are lives where we're constantly repenting throughout the day in our minds that we say to God, please forgive me, Lord, for this. When we are in a sin, when we do a sin, we should be asking for forgiveness. We should be confessing our sin. The life of a Christian should be a life of confession. And I'm not talking about a life where you go and confess sin to somebody else. I'm talking about you going to God and confess your sin. That you start naming sins specifically that you've done. And if you can't name sins specifically that you've done, you don't know who you are. Naming names on, on sins and confessing them before God because it glorifies him. Now, the connective with that is that we ask forgiveness as the people of God. We talked about this last week when I talked about how in our culture, we're used to saying normally two things. We're used to saying, I'm sorry, and I apologize. Those are the two things that we are used to saying. However, none of those are ever used in Scripture. We never see that in Scripture. Not in the context of confessing sin, confessing wrong, confessing faults. You never see somebody, you don't ever see anybody saying, Lord, I'm sorry. You don't see that. It is always, Lord, please forgive me. Because the term that we use, I'm sorry, 
that's only talking about your emotional state. As somebody that's sorry is feeling sorrowful. And so that's only proclaiming the people your emotional state. Any sorrow that is a true sorrow must lead to action. And that action is confession of sin and true repentance, as it says in 2 Corinthians 7.10. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world works death. So you do have two kinds of sorrow. You can have sorrow from the world and you can have the sorrow from God. But the sorrow from God leads to action. And that action is confession of sin and repentance. What many Christians fail to realize when it comes to confession of sin is that confessing sin is about worship. It's about worship. When we go to James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Confess your faults, which means your sins and your transgressions, one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. <clears throat> Now, it was routine in worship of the first century to confess sin before taking the Lord's Supper. And we have largely abandoned that today. There are churches who don't take the time to preface their taking of the Lord's Supper with the gravity and seriousness that it requires. There's no time for confession of sin before God and in the congregation. It is simply a religious ritual and people just fall under God's judgment because of it. They don't take it seriously. And you have people who take the Lord's table and never confess they sin. And never looked at their sin throughout the week. They haven't confessed it. And they don't even confess it before they take the table. It's kind of like a cover your basis type deal because we're more sinful than we think we are and it will be good for us to just confess our sin before God because we don't even know the depths of our own sin. The life of a believer should be a life of confession. A release of that sin we have in our hearts to the Lord. And with in that confession is a trust that the Lord will be gracious with us and that our duty from that confession is to repent. This is why repentance and confession, those two are inextricably tied together, inextricably. In a heart that's truly regenerated, there's some people who try to confess and never repent and your confession doesn't really mean anything. It means nothing. Confessing sin is some religious right, but never having a desire or intention to turn from that sin is a waste of your breath. God doesn't hear those kinds of confessions. As it says in Psalm 66.18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And so we must come with confession and repentance. Well, this morning, we're going to conclude our series, The Voice in the Wilderness. And this morning, we're going to do something we haven't done in a very long time. We're actually going to move through more than one verse. And I'm going to try to keep a pace that Mark keeps in this gospel because Mark's gospel is fast paced because of the word immediately. And we'll talk about that as soon as we get to the first time that it occurs. And we'll talk in depth about his use of that word. He's that's his word. Uh, as far as all the gospels are concerned, he this is his, his favorite word in this gospel. So let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Mark chapter one. And we're going to be reading verses six through eight. Mark chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Let's read. 
Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Let's look at verse six. Now this verse switches to John's apparel. It starts talking about his clothes. Now there's a reason for that. In those days, the Pharisees, they dressed in long flowing robes and they were expensive and they had little tassels on the bottom. And they, you know, these, these were the guys coming and dressing in three piece suits all the time. And these, that's what they were dressed in. They were uh, nicely dressed, had money, they had fine clothes and people respected them because of it. And that's no different today. We see this within the church of the people of God who have on nice clothes and somehow that's supposed to make them more spiritual, which is ridiculous. There's even times where I've had personal conversations with people as if how you dressed is reflective of your spiritual condition. Scripture says the very opposite. Let's, if we, when we point out John the Baptist's apparel, let's look at John the Baptist's apparel. It talks about he was in camel's hair and his loin girdle, he had a girdle around his loins. See, what they were doing here is contrasting it to those who were presenting themselves as godly in his time. And John also was coming as the prophets of old came. You have to understand up until this point, we got 400 years and there's no prophets. They only they haven't heard from God in 400 years. All they've had is Pharisees and scribes and all the rest of that, but no real power. And so he was coming like the prophets of old. It was a reflection of his <clears throat> calling as a prophet. As a matter of fact, how he was dressed is a direct connection of him being the Elijah to come. Because it was how Elijah was dressed. When I mean, you go to 2 Kings 1.8, it says, And they answered him, and he was a hairy man, so we're talk, talking about Elijah, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah, the Tishbite. And so there is this reminiscent uh, quality of the prophets of old, and specifically Elijah, in the way that he's dressed. In addition, it was a testimony to his disconnection from the world for the glory of God. He was not like everybody else. He was strange to many people in how he lived and how he conducted himself. There was a simplicity in his living that was a direct contrast to those who were considered holy in their society. Matthew Henry comments here, he says, in John's way of living, there was the beginning of a gospel spirit, for it bespoke great self-denial, mortification of the flesh, a holy contempt of the world, and nonconformity to it, which may truly be called the beginning of the gospel of Christ in any soul. So we have this Dressing in camel's hair, you know, hairy, and he's out in the middle of the desert, and he's eating locusts and wild honey, and he's got this disconnection from the world. Now, you have a lot of people who say, who say they don't want to be like everybody else, right? They want to be unique. They want to be the one of a kind. They want to be different. They want to do me kind of mentality. Yet when it comes to pressing this out in their lives, they end up actually just being like everybody else. Right? People talking about, I, I want a tattoo because I want to be different. And yet everybody and their mama's getting tattoos. How's that different? You're not being any different than anybody else. You're being the same. That's not different. Now we have this same mentality in the church today. Right? Instead of pressing out in our lives to be 
more holy, more righteous, more loving, more merciful, more compassionate, and just generally being conformed more to the image of Christ, you will find that there are many people who would just rather be mediocre in holiness, righteousness, and as a witness for Christ. Weak, anemic, they're just barely hanging on. And somehow people are supposed to have some kind of sympathy for them because they don't have the drive to take care of their own faith. Uh, the Bible's clear on this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling is what it says. They have people that try to help folks and those folks never want any help. Try to help him in life. Try to help him push out righteousness. Try to help him live godliness. Try to help him structure their lives in a way that is going to please God. And they don't want that. They don't want that. You know what they want? They want what they want. And so they end up just being like everybody else. Weak. Anemic. No power. They swear they Christian. Swear they Christian. But you be hard pressed to see that in their lives. You know, I was talking to my son in Columbus, my son in the faith, and I was talking to him and we were talking about somebody who we knew. And I said, you know, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that if you were in a court of law and charges were brought against you, that you were a Christian, would you be convicted? Would there be enough evidence to convict you? A lot of people swear that they're Christians, and yet when you look at their lives, there would be no evidence. No conviction here. Let them loose. He's like everybody else. Just let them loose. He's good. No conviction. No evidence. And then... So these kind of people, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to push the envelope. They're just too lazy, too tired, too weak. It's just not important enough to them. And then those who do press the envelope and take their faith more seriously as they are here on earth, well, they're looked at as strange. They're looked at as holier than thou. And, and there's, some, there's some truth to that, even in, when we're looking at John the Baptist. We'll get to that in a second. They looked at as weird. This is in the church. They looked at as, why are you not like everyone else? So, well, that's true uniqueness. That's truly being different. Uh, truly being different is being more righteous, more holy, more loving, more compassionate. Uh, that's being truly different in the vast majority of Christians today would rather be just kind of this mediocre run with the crowd mentality not being any different and they live their lives like that it's pitiful now we find in this verse that John the Baptist he had a simple life and in his simple living he kept the law in his diet he ate honey and wild locusts which he could eat because these were things that were allowable under the Levitical law and when we look at Levit Leviticus 11.22 it says even though even these of them you may eat the locust after it is his kind and the bald locust after his kind and the beetle after his kind, not that I would ever eat a beetle, but anyway, and the grasshopper after his kind. If I was, I guess I'm really, if I'm really pressed for it, I'm gonna, you know, I'll go ahead and eat a beetle, right? Let's go ahead and go to our takeaway point number one this morning, which says this, beloved, the Christian life should be a simple life. Christian life should be a simple life. It is a simple life that can be the most productive life. We make life complex, but God wants us to live in the simplicity of Christ and in his kingdom. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 1.12 when he says, For our boast is this, 
The testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God and supremely so toward you. I had a friend of mine I hadn't seen in a very long time. And this is about a month or so ago, a little, maybe a little bit over a month or so ago. He comes over and he comes into the house and this is what he says. He goes, oh my gosh, this is exactly as I remembered it. The, our living room, we're in the living room. He goes, man, everything is exactly as I remembered it. As if, I guess we're supposed to change furniture every five years or something. And I said, yeah. And this is what I said. I said, yeah, it's something you can count on. It's something you can count on. Simplicity. Not feeling, you know, and what does it mean by this? Simple means singleness of purpose with sincerity. It means that we are busy about the things that matter with a singleness of focus as opposed to being all over the place. It's not ostentatious, it's not showy, it's not complicating our lives and filling it with empty, vain endeavors. It's not simplicity. Simplicity is focus with singleness of mind. Singleness of mind. Making our lives less cluttered with stuff that doesn't need to be there. With sincerity. Now it's also important to note and this is just a little note that people don't realize is that John the Baptist is a priest. John the Baptist, he was actually a priest. His father was a priest. And since he is a, he's a male in the line of the priest, he is actually a priest. And when we look at Luke 1, 5, it says there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, which is John the Baptist's dad of that course of Abiah and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. So uh, you have both of them priests from the priestly line, right? You have Elizabeth, she's from Aaron and you have Zacharias and he's from Aaron because he's a priest. And so technically John the Baptist is a priest. And that is fitting because a prophet and priest is going to be the forerunner of the prophet and priest. So fitting. God doesn't do any of this stuff by accident. Nothing's a coincidence. So you move on to verse 7. We move on to verse 7. And John the Baptist says, There's one coming after me who's mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and unlatch. And he's talking about sandals there. Now, this is the second time. And he says, and he preached. This is what he preached, right? And this is the second time we're alerted to the fact that John preached, right? Let's look at this word preach, because it's very important. Let's look at the word preach. Preach. It's the Greek word, keruso. Russo. It means to herald, to proclaim, or to publish, especially divine truth. When we preach, we are heralding or proclaiming or publishing divine truth. It's important to understand that God raised up preachers as his people. Maybe some of you out there are saying, I'm not a preacher. Yes, you are. If you're a child of God, you're a preacher. It comes with the territory. And if you don't look at yourself as a preacher, then you're not fulfilling your ministry. All believers are preachers. Every Christian is a preacher, and we had that a couple weeks back. Or every, every Christian should be a preacher. Because we are all called to proclaim. We are all called to preach the truth and the gospel. Now, it might not necessarily mean that you have a pulpit ministry like this, where you got a congregation and all that. 
That, that's, it's not necessarily what it means. What it means is that we all have a ministry and a pulpit to speak from in the proclamation of the truth and the gospel and the truth of the gospel. Every Christian does. We all, as the people of God, have that responsibility. Privilege, as a matter of fact. Privilege. What John preached was about the Messiah. Specifically, that he was, go- he was coming. And that his coming was on the horizon. He says, there's one coming after me. So, his coming must be close. He was coming after John. Now understand, the people in that time were convinced John was a prophet. John testified and preached. One was coming after him. And he says, who is mightier than me? His ministry would be stronger than his. His influence would be more widespread than his. John said that he was unworthy to stoop down and unlatch the buckle off of the sandals of the one who was coming after him. This is significant to John's audience because to unlatch the buckle off of somebody's shoes, that was a duty of a slave. <clears throat> and what was even more striking was that this duty was thought to be below even a Hebrew slave back in those times let alone a disciple of any rabbi. And so John was presenting himself as one who was unworthy to perform one of the most lowly and menial tasks of a slave to the one coming after him, though he was chosen by God to be his herald. He was called. This would have placed within the minds of the hearers a picture of somebody who was coming who had to be very great. Sounds more like God that's coming. I want you to notice something also about John's attitude. He understood his place in light of who he was serving. He didn't come with pride. He didn't come like, I I deserve this or privilege. This is the same prophet Jesus said was the greatest prophet to ever live. John 7, 38 says, and stood at his feet. Uh Oh, this is the wrong one. Yeah, yeah, this is wrong. This is not the right one. So it's John 7, 38? Well, John 7 something. (laughs) But Jesus says in, not John, but Luke 7. I don't know why he said John. It says Luke right in my notes right there. Well, he says, there's no greater prophet born among women There is no one greater than John. I want you to know how he came. He came in humility. And thought soberly about who he was as a human being, which takes us to takeaway point number two this morning. Takeaway point number two this morning is this. You must have a godly estimation of yourself. Have a godly estimation of yourself. See, this is what we are called to do as the people of God. It says that you must have a godly estimation of yourself. Romans chapter 1, verse 12, verse 3. What does it say? It says this. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, Mm. but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Every man has a measure of faith. So we should have a godly estimation of ourselves. See, therein is where true humility lies. It is not in debasing ourselves, 
to where we are nothing. Because when we do that, what we're saying, what God has made is nothing. And that would be wrong when we do that. That's why that's pride. That's why when people who abase themselves and just keeps abasing, them, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this. You want to know what that is? That is pride. Because you're saying that you're calling what God called very good, not good. Because in Genesis 131, he says, and God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. And this is after he had created man. He said, very good. And up until that point, he says, and it was good. But after man was created, he said, it was very good. So the addition of man was, um, it took it up a level. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. You have to have a godly estimation of yourself. So you don't go around and debase yourself and keep saying, I, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And then you don't go around saying I'm the greatest in the world and everything too. Both are prideful. Both of them are. One is prideful because you would deem to be prideful enough to say to God, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. This is why God, when he was talking to Moses and Moses kept saying, no, I can't do it. He got mad at him. God got mad at him. Go back and look at that in Exodus. Stop saying the opposite of what God is saying, which is exactly what Moses is doing. That's what he was doing. God was calling him to do it. It is having spiritual eyes that sees who we are in its proper context with that proper balance in the whole scheme of things. William McDonald says in his commentary, spirit filled preaching always exalts the Lord Jesus and dethrones self. So if you want to know if you are preaching, you're listening to godly preaching, just go ahead and measure how much they're lifting up the name of Jesus and how much they're lifting up Jesus and how much they're lifting up themselves or something else. One thing we tend to do as human beings is we tend to think of ourselves more important than we actually are. We even have churches. They want to proclaim that we are the center of our own universe. John the Baptist lifted up the Christ as being so good and so righteous and so holy that he couldn't even touch the latches on his sandals. He couldn't even touch them. He was such a force that was coming after him that he couldn't even do the most menial task of the lowest slave in reference to him. John the Baptist knew who he was. He had no compunctions about telling people about who he was in light of Christ. He didn't say, oh, well, you know, I want to be better, but you know, he's better than me, but I'll be better later. Just give me some time. He didn't say nothing stupid or crazy like that. Because he was exalting Christ. And to him, that was his job. That's what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to exalt Christ. It's no different for any believer today. We exalt Christ. We should lift up the name of Christ. We should glorify Christ. And then John preached this. This is what he says in verse 8. He goes, I baptize you with water. But he comes after me, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, what does this mean? Let's take a look at this. First thing John does, is he compares the baptism that he administers with the baptism that Christ was going to minister when he came. He ratifies his ministry of baptism unto repentance. So it's not saying that he shouldn't have done the baptism of repentance. He should, which is why we are baptized today. He explains that his baptism is one that is influential, but not like the baptism that is coming from Christ. Let's go ahead and go to takeaway point number three. Takeaway point number three this morning is this. We must go through two baptisms. We must go through two baptisms. John's baptism 
was symbolic. It was the precursor to another baptism. It was a symbol of it. In the preacher's homiletical commentary, it describes baptism this way. It says, Was there any inward and spiritual grace in the baptism of John, of which the washing with water might be considered a sign? We are obliged to answer in the negative. The ceremony itself was well calculated to make an impression upon those who submitted to it. But the same may be said of many other rites, which have nothing spiritual or supernatural about them. Such impressions may easily be accounted for and furnish no proof that there has been an extraordinary exertion of divine influence. What he's saying here is that baptism is a precursor, but it doesn't change you. It doesn't do anything to you internally. It is a symbol and a sign. It is actually, listen now very closely, water baptism is actually a response that a change has already taken place. It should be. However, this is different from the Messiah's baptism. He contrasts his and the Messiah's. The Messiah's baptism is life infusing and soul changing. The baptism of Christ and the Holy Ghost raises people from the dead. Go ahead and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to read through verses 4 through 7 this morning. And I want you guys to take a look at this because this is bat. And we're also going to explain some other things about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. But let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 4 through 7 this morning. So let's go there. It says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Now, this is very important. The baptism of the Holy Ghost raises us from the dead. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a baptism of resurrection. You can also look at it this way. The baptism of Christ, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it makes us into new creations. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So, in a nutshell, the baptism of Christ makes a person saved. It makes a person saved. It is God's act of regeneration and justification. That's what it is. Now, let me tell you what it's not. What John is talking about here is not speaking in tongues. Being baptized with the Holy Spirit has absolutely nothing to do with speaking in tongues. Nothing. This erroneous interpretation of what it means to be baptized with the Holy Ghost has caused more confusion in the church than a little bit. Baptism with the Holy Ghost is to be fully immersed with the Holy Spirit of God unto salvation. It is what happens at the point of regeneration in the heart of a believer. This is the mark of what it means to be a true Christian. This mark is not seen by speaking another language because heathen religions have that. That's not a mark of whether a person is saved. That nonsense is nonsense. It borders on heresy. I just give them the benefit of the doubt that the people who believe this are just ignorant. And not knowing 
what the Word of God says. Being baptized with the Holy Ghost is someone who has been indwelt, immersed by the Holy Spirit. That's what baptism means, remember? Baptizo, Greek, fully immersed. How can you be fully immersed with the Holy Spirit? Have him indwell you, fill you up. That is how you are immersed in the Holy Spirit. And how do we know that somebody has been baptized in the Holy Spirit? It's not because they're speaking in other tongues. Like I say, heathen religions do that. It is an exhibition of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit immerses you, he doesn't immerse you and just nothing happens. Okay, he immerses you and then the requisite fruit should be seen. It's like what J.C. Ryle says. You can best believe if there's no holiness in somebody's life, there's no Holy Spirit because there's no fruit. And what's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Well, it tells us this in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, where it says, but the fruit of the Spirit what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there's no law. Is, are you growing in this? Are these things growing in your life? Do you have any of these? There's people who just don't have it. Do you have more love in your life? I mean, if you truly got saved, then... Is it more love in your life than it was last year? Is it more peace in your life than last year? Do, are you a more patient individual? Are you more gentle? Do you have more self-control? Do you have that? Because if so, you've been baptized by the Holy Ghost. You've been baptized by the Holy Ghost. Immersed in Him. Immersed in Him. You stay that way as well. If someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit, in this case, the immersion of the Holy Spirit in their lives, then they don't have Christ. That's that simple. In other words, an absence of the Holy Spirit means you are not saved. Now, on that point, they got it right. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't be saved. Absolutely, 100% correct. Romans 8, 9 says this. But you're not in the flesh. He's talking to the believers in Rome. He says, you're not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. If so, that the spirit of God, what? Dwell in you. If you are immersed in the spirit. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, guess what? Oh, well, he's none of his. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, listen now. The spirit of Christ is what it says in this verse. And when we go back to Mark chapter 1, verse 8, what does he say? He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Right? He's equating the two. There's a synonymous thing going on here. Spirit of Christ is spirit of the, the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, and you could see that from the previous part of the verse we're not going to take apart this verse but i'm just saying we're saying the, all these things synonymous spirit of god spirit of christ holy spirit all the same if you don't have him if you not are not immersed in him well you're not a you're not a his you're not a christ you're not saved period period Ezekiel says it like this because God foretold that this is what he was going to do in Ezekiel 36, 27. He says, and I will put my spirit where? Within you. Within you. And cause you. Listen now. Listen. Baptism of the spirit. Putting my spirit within you. Walking in the spirit. We've got this in Ephesians. Walking in my statutes and in my judgments and do them you have walking in the spirit baptized in the spirit being filled with the spirit these are all connected with one another but I'll tell you one thing none of them has anything to do with you going off and speaking in some other babbling language it has nothing to do with that excuse me <clears throat> This is a requirement. It is a requirement for us to be saved, 
for the Holy Spirit to indwell. We must be immersed in the Holy Spirit. It's a requirement. It's a necessity. If you are not immersed in the Holy Spirit, then guess what? Spiritual things are like French to you. This is why there's a lot of people who just never get it. It, they, it could be they never get it because they're not saved. Because they don't have what is absolutely necessary to grasp the things that God is saying to us. Natural men can't grasp that. That's why it says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. It does not receive them. Why? Because the Spirit of God is not, they're not immersed in the Spirit of God. They're not immersed in the Spirit of God. So it can't receive them, for they are foolishness unto him. Listen, they can't receive them. They think they're foolishness. Third thing, they can, neither can they know them. They, they, they can't even comprehend them because they do not have the Spirit of God. This is just what it says at the end of the verse, because they are spiritually discerned. And if you are just a natural man, you won't get it. You won't understand ever. You won't get it. The gospel will just be foolishness under you. All of that stuff, you just won't get it. Now, there's a lot of times, and don't, don't misunderstand me, there's a lot of times people don't get things and they don't understand things because they won't study and do, the, and do the requisite work. That's different. There's Christians galore out there who won't do that. Their understanding isn't based on that they don't have the Holy Spirit. Their understanding is limited and based on the fact that they're lazy. That's what that's about. But a natural man can't this is this is the reason why a natural man can't sit down and read the Bible and get it. This is why they sit down and read the Bible and then you see the kind of conclusions that they're coming up with, which are off the wall. Why? No Holy Spirit. That's why. It's absolutely essential. The Holy Spirit is the one who opens our eyes and opens our ears. We're able to see. We're able to understand. These things are spiritually discerned. And it's not our spirit, but the Spirit of God, which must, we must be immersed in. We must be baptized by Christ. He must give us His Spirit. Immerse us in His Spirit. In order for us to get that stuff, in order for that stuff to connect with us, in order for the gospel to connect with us. Otherwise, we are not going to get it. That stuff will just be foolishness and babble. You know, it's just babbleness, a religious nonsense to us. This is why, like I said, people go to the Bible and says, I don't understand it. You ever have somebody say that to you? They say, I try to read the Bible. I don't understand it. I understand why you don't understand it. You don't have the Holy Spirit. That's why you don't understand it. This stuff is just gobbledygook to you. You remember your days? Before you became saved and you tried to read the Bible, you know what that was? You were like, oh my gosh, I don't know what this stuff is. This is I'm lost. Right. Well, the reason why you were lost is because you were lost. You had no Holy Spirit, no power, no faculty whatsoever to comprehend, understand, see, or hear spiritual things. So these two baptisms are necessary. The water baptism is necessary. The water baptism should come as a response of the Holy Spirit baptism. There's a regeneration going on in the heart that goes to be baptized in water. Why? They want to identify publicly with Christ. There's a change that has gone on in their hearts. Now, some people, they do that as, as some kind of just a religious rite, and they just come, they go down sinners and they come up sinners, and they just wet, and that's all that means. It's just like we were talking about earlier. Baptism in that sense means absolutely nothing. Should they get baptized again when they get saved? Yeah, I think so. You Because you didn't really get saved, you didn't really identify with Christ at the first one. Yeah. Do it again. Do it again. So of these two baptisms, one is going to publicly identify you with Christ. The other one is going to identify you as a Christian. And you need them both. Because one's going to lead you to the other. One's going to lead you to the other. The question that comes to us this morning is this then. Have you experienced both baptisms? One unto repentance and one unto salvation? 
Have you been baptized by the Holy Spirit? Has your affections and desires changed to be for those things that promote godliness and holiness and righteousness? Have you crafted and structured your life to live in accordance to the word of God because your heart's desire is to see God glorified in everything? Has that happened? That when God is pleased, when Christ is pleased, you're pleased. Christians who don't live in power and peace do so because they grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians tell us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. We as Christians do it all the time. But in that sense, it's a continuous grieving of the Holy Spirit. It is not turning from a way that they should not be on. Not turning from that way. There are others who have just fooled themselves into believing they are saved and they're just religious. And they know some things about Christ and they know that Christ is real and whatever, but they just haven't given their lives up. You need to know the difference, my friends. You need to know the difference. You need to know if you've actually been baptized with the Holy Spirit or whether you're just a religious individual. Gathering among a whole bunch of Christians. Don't be the latter. Come to the Lord. Receive the second baptism, or actually the first baptism. Let Christ give you everlasting life. Don't be a slave to sin any longer. Don't be a slave to the world any longer. Stop being a slave to the devil any longer. Because all that's going to get you is hell and damnation. Submit yourself to the Lord. And believe that Jesus came to save sinners of which you are one. Everyone on the planet needs his salvation. For there is no salvation without him. So fall upon the mercy of Christ, which he displayed on the cross in taking our sins upon his person. Repent and believe the gospel and be baptized by his spirit. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance and give you peace. Thank you, beloved. Now may you go in peace and serve Christ with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength every day. God willing, until we meet the next time. God bless.